Please welcome uh, Akshay Agarwal. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm going to try really hard to not trip over Poppy, so I'm going to just stand right here. Um, so I'm Akshay, and I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been working on for two years now, actually, with my code maintainer Miles, who's sitting right there. Um, and this project is an open source reactive notebook for Python. Um, it's on GitHub. You can download it today uh, from PyPy. And uh, just for the record, I think that Python notebooks are really awesome. I think they're an amazing tool um, because they let you mix code, markdown, and visuals like all in one place. And they're one of the few tools that let you see your data while you work with it. Um, so they're indispensable for research, for education, for data science, and a, a bunch of different use cases. And I think I'm not the only one who thinks that. There's over 10 million Jupyter notebooks on GitHub as of a few years ago. Um, but I have also learned in the past few years that there are a lot of people who don't like notebooks. Um, so this is a sample of random tweets that I've seen on my feed uh, in like the past month. It could be algorithm bias. Um, but th there's a lot of people voicing their complaints with notebooks. And I think one of the biggest complaints that often comes up is this idea of hidden state. Uh, and, and so what that is is that um, you can often get into scenarios where the code you see on the page doesn't match the outputs um, you see in the document. So this is an example of a CoLab notebook, which is a hosted Jupyter notebook running with IPython kernel. We've got two blocks of code, x equals 1, and then x. Uh, but it looks like the value of x is 0, even though we have x equals 1 here. Um, and it's like really easy to get into these situations when working with Python notebooks. Here's another one. Now all we see is x, and we see that its value is 0, but we don't see it assigned anywhere. Um, and, and this like really trips up like both beginners and like um, like expert coders alike, I think, and at least like a lot of sort of wasted time debugging. Um, and like to drive the point home, uh, those 10 million notebooks that I mentioned on GitHub, uh, JetBrains analyzed. They did some study a few years ago, uh, looking at all of them, and they found that over a third of them. Uh, weren't reproducible. They weren't computationally reproducible because they weren't executed in a top to bottom fashion, but someone executed the first cell, then the third, then the second. Um, and so it was, it's, it's kind of a big issue, especially for like the sciences in general. Um, so recognizing this, um, a couple of years ago, um, after spending a lot of time working with notebooks, so I, I had just finished a PhD, uh, on vector embeddings, I use notebooks every day. Um, I kind of wanted to set out and make, uh, you know, our, my own version of a notebook. And these are sort of some of the criteria that sort of I settled on after studying other uh, prior art too. Um, I wanted a notebook that was reproducible, and in particular, just the code on the page should match the outputs you see. Um, I wanted it to be maintainable like any other uh, software artifact. Um, and I wanted it to be productionizable or reusable in some sense. So I wanted to be able to execute my notebooks as scripts without jumping through any hoops. And I wanted to be able to share them as little interactive web apps um, so that like, people who didn't know Python could explore my data without having to, without having to learn how to code, basically. Um, so whether or not it was wise, about two years ago, you know, Miles and I set out to create a new notebook. And we didn't do it because it was easy. We thought it would be easy. Yeah. <laughs> it hasn't been easy. Um, with that, uh, l l let me show you a live demo. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> OK. Um, so this is a Marima notebook. Right now, this is just some boilerplate code. Um, I've got a cell here that's going to generate a plot of, uh, of a sine wave. So I'm going to just hide the code of these cells free up some real estate. And now I'm going to create a new cell here. Uh, I'm going to create a couple of variables uh, that I'll need to generate a plot of a sine wave. So I'm going to create amplitude, give it a number, uh, a value. 
the period, 2 pi. And then I'm going to call my plotting function uh, with the amplitude and the period. I'll hit enter. OK. So I've got, a, I've got a sine wave, nothing fancy so far. They should all be familiar uh, if you've used a Python notebook before. Now, one way that, you know, the biggest way that Marimo is different from a traditional notebook um, is that it reacts to your changes in code. So I've changed the amplitude to 2. I'm going to run just the amplitude cell, and you'll see the graph got bigger. It, it reacted um, to the new value. Um, and you, know, you, you can do this at inf infinitum, and you'll just see things changing live. Um, similar to you know, any other notebook, you can also write markdown uh, in a Marima notebook. It's, it's, the syntax is a little special. And because our notebooks are pure Python, uh, you first import the Marimo library. I import it as Mo. And now I'm going to write a markdown string with mo.md. So what's cool about using a function for this is that I can actually interpolate Python values uh, into my markdown. So I can, for example, I can write some LaTeX, and I can say, let's plot. Uh, the graph of f of x equals amplitude times the sine of 2 times mp dot pi, the period. x. OK, so I've got some LaTeX now. And as I change this variable, the amplitude variable, not only will uh, the plot change down here, but also my LaTeX is changing, because everything is just recalculating. I don't have to manually remember to uh, update uh, to, to run, run dependent cells. And because we have this reactivity, it actually opens up a powerful dimension of interactivity. Uh, so Marimo comes packaged with uh, UI elements, which you can access through the Marimo library. So for example, I can convert this slider from an integer, I mean this integer for, into a slider, ranging from 1 to 2. I'll give it a step. Um, I'm going to output it here. And the only thing I'm going to do now, I'm going to take all my amplitude variables and access their value attribute instead. Um, now, if I'm, I'm going to hit this button in the bottom right to run all my modified cells. And now you'll see I've got the slider here. I'm going to hide my code cells just so I can see everything going on. Uh, and as I scrub this slider, the LaTeX updates, the plot updates, and all of a sudden, like, my code, my data is actually feels kind of tangible. And in, in the spirit of actually a, an earlier talk by Pamela today, this is like a really simple of example of something you can do uh, using these building blocks. Um, but we have some more uh, powerful elements. Find it here. So for example, I've built this uh, embedding visualizer notebook. Uh, so in, in this notebook, I'm going to hide the code cells. Um, we're looking at an embedding of a data set, set called MNIST, which contains uh, a bunch of numerical digits, uh, 0 through 9. Each point is a, in, in the scatter plot represents a different digit. Um, and they're colored by their digit class, 0 through 9. And so now what I can do using just Marimo's reactivity is I can select some points here, and I can get a live preview of the images that I've selected below. Um, and like, this is something that for me personally would have been really useful in my research, because um, I made a lot of embeddings looking like that one, and I had no idea really what was inside uh, the clusters that I was looking at. Um, and there's more down here, hard to see it. But as I move, I'm, there's, there's a table. This is a preview of the points I've selected. This table has all the points I've selected. It's got data distribution. I can sort them. Uh, and then I can like, pick out, for example, outliers in my cluster. Like, why is there an 8 in my cluster of 2s? Why, I don't know, these 8s look kind of funky. That 7 looks kind of like a 2, maybe, et cetera. So really, um, I, I, I think. What I'm trying to show with this example is how you can use these simple ideas to really make your data come to life. 
Um, and if you're curious about the code, um, the interactive chart was just one line of code um, wrapping an, an Altair plot using the Altair Vega library uh, in, our, in our, one of our special UI elements. And then the, the chart's value is, the, is a data frame of the selected objects. Okay. It wasn't easy, but we thought it would be easy. Um, so, when, when I mention reproducibility, I, I guess what I'm getting at is reactive execution, this auto-calculating property that Marimo has. Um, and in particular, you know, the issue that traditional notebooks have that we're trying to solve here is this idea of immutable workspace and arbitrary cell execution order. That creates hidden state in the notebook because the variables in memory depend on the code and the execution order. So what we tried to do is create a notebook where the variables in, the, in memory and the outputs on the page depend only on code. And you know, we studied prior art, and really the, the insight, there is no insight, really is that we, we learned from the original reactive notebook, i.e. Excel, where you edit a cell and things automatically calculate. It's super intuitive um, and it's super powerful. So Marimo recalculates like a spreadsheet, as, as you saw in these examples. Um, oh, this is a kind of a cool feature. If you delete a variable that's, um, if you delete a variable, Marimo will automatically clean it up and invalidate de uh, dependent cells, uh, which is a common case of bugs when working with traditional notebooks. Let's get through these. And just a little bit on, on how we accomplish this. Um, so every Marimo notebook is actually statically analyzed. All the, all the cells are analyzed um, before they're run. Uh, to form a, form a DAG, a directed acyclic graph uh, on the cells. We mark each cells with their variable definitions and their references. And then basically from there, you know how data should flow through the notebook. Um, to make this actually work, we have to introduce some constraints. Um, and to be honest, we weren't sure how our users would react to these constraints. Um, but we had to ban variable reassignment. You can only have one variable. In the, so if you have to declare variable x, you can't redeclare it in another cell. We have to ban cycles, uh, and the reason you ban, ban cycles, I mean, Im imagine if you had a cycle on something like this, it would go kind of crazy. Um, and we have to discourage our users from mutating variables across cells, because there are some corner cases where we can't, uh, that we can't capture using just static analysis. Um, it turned out, though, we weren't sure how people would react. But I think because of this Excel model, people were kind of used to it. They kind of got it. I think beginners to Python actually found it very intuitive, um, and that, that was a learning moment for us. And I should point out, uh, you know, we're standing on the shoulder, uh, shoulders of some giants who've paved the way. Um, these two projects in particular, huge inspiration for us. Uh, Pluto is a reactive notebook for the Julia uh, programming language uh, with uh, really widespread use in education an absolutely delightful project, which was inspired by the Observable Notebook, uh, which is a reactive notebook for JavaScript. Um, OK. So that was all about reproducibility through reactive execution. Uh, the second component that we really wanted to get at was making notebooks more maintainable. So traditional notebooks are often stored as JSON, because uh, they store the outputs in them. And that makes it really hard to, to version them with tools like Git or otherwise treat them as real software. So we elected for a pure Python file format. And the main properties are that if you make a small change to your code, you're guaranteed to get a small Git diff. Uh, you can execute them as scripts. Uh, and we decided to make the, the file format lazy so you can import them as a module. Um, so if you're curious, I can show an example. So like here, here's a simple notebook on the left, which is just doing some arithmetic, adding two numbers, x and y, and printing the output. And on the right, you can see this gets serialized uh, as a Python file. Each cell is put into a function um, with a code containing the cell, cell code and some uh, additional annotations. 
If you scroll to the bottom, we see if name equals main guard, uh, guarding an app.run, which will actually execute the notebook in topological order. Um, and so actually, so I mentioned notebooks, you can run these notebooks as scripts, and this is actually another idea that we took uh, inspiration from by looking at pleto.jl. Um, so here, the value x you can see is either zero or is set by um, this function call, mo.cli args. Uh, so in this case, I can actually go to the command line, type Python, uh, this is called arithmetic, I think, dash x. I'm going to set x to 1. It should add 1 and 1. I should get 2 out. And run it, and you'll see I got 2. Simple example, but you can imagine using this in like data engineering context and, and things like that. Okay. Uh, and the last component, the last property we wanted was like reusability or productionizability, sharing notebooks as apps, running them as scripts. I just showed you scripts, and for apps, um, it's actually quite simple. Just hide all the code cells. It looks like you kind of look like you have an app. And our, our CLI has a command, Marimo run, which will serve your notebook as a read-only web app. Um, and you can have multiple uh, clients connected to it, and they each get their own session. Um, and I guess w one lesson, one big lesson that sort of we, we took away while building Marimo is like staying true to like a design pillar. So our pillar was that like every notebook is, is modeled as a DAG on blocks of Python code. And that enabled notebook style visual co computation, reactive web apps, and execution as a script. Uh, we did have some users asking us like, uh, you know, can I just turn that mode on and off? Can I have a Jupyter mode? And can I have you know, a Marimo reactive mode. And we thought about it, and we, we decided not to, uh, just because it would basically invalidate, you know, all, all, everything that we're trying to enable. You flip that Jupyter mode on, or that, you know, the uh, imperative mode on, and, um, you know, all the downstream use cases break. So instead, we sort of tried to meet them in the middle, and we, we now have a feature um, that uh, makes, lets you make the runtime lazy while still enforcing uh, that the, the DAG property. Um, oh, one, one small thing is that you can also run these notebooks entirely in the browser. We found this helpful for education. Uh, we're using the Pyodide, um, Pyodide library, and you can try it at marimo.app. Um, here's a bunch of links. I think the most important one is you can find us on GitHub. We're totally open source. Um, there's a gallery of examples. And, okay, uh, the, just a small piece of backstory. This is Marimo's namesake. Uh, that, that's a Marimo. It's, it's a little algae that clumps together to form a, a Marimo moss ball. Uh, you can find them in some lake beds in Japan and Europe. And, I don't know, they're really cute. They're adorable. Uh, I had a Marimo as a, a mascot during COVID. So, yeah, thank you.